大家早上好。Good morning, everyone. Welcome you to Caixin Debate China Reforms Agenda,、uh, the economic growth strategy given the new normal, jointly organized by WEF and Caixin Media.、Uh, the word "new normal" has been popular. It seems that the people's understanding about new normal so far is、uh, more optimistic. It seems that、uh, it's just a new, but still normal. But Now it seems that、uh, the focus of a new normal is still with new instead of normal. Why is it new? First, the economic challenges are more dire than what we expected. Originally, we thought、uh, GBT, GDP、uh, will slow down from 8 percent of growth to about 7 percent. So, in the long term, we will still maintain relatively high growth. But now it seems that the challenges are bigger. There is、uh, current research. More than 70 times of the high-growth economies,、uh, when they study,、uh, when they stopped their high-growth period, they will have a sharp economic slowdown. China needs to exert even more efforts in order to avoid that. And secondly, we now have a more perception about the role of the government. In the past one year, we experienced the bubbles of stock market and the stock crash. And bailout. It seems that the hands of the government can help bailout during emergencies and avoid the、uh, emergencies or、uh, systematic risk and regional risk. However, the fundamentals of the stock market will still experience roller coaster, and、uh, it is、uh, impossible for you to really cure the disease without experiencing pain. And certainly, there is a very dire challenges for SOEs. In the past uh, period, uh, there are a lot of favorable policies and.、Uh, Great macroeconomic situation. It seems that、uh, the SOEs are very competitive and、uh, lucrative.、Uh, however, now a lot of、uh, SOEs are in very serious、uh, challenges. How to reform and、uh, give dynamism to SOEs? And number four, private sector is uh, the uh, source of、uh, dynamism. Without doubt, how to develop a private business in a new form. The only issue is how to implement it. So to cope with all these challenges, we need innovation and new ideas and new actions. We have invited distinguished panelists for today. They are from China Association for Public Companies Chairman Mr. Wang Jianzhou, who was the chairman of CMCC, Mr. Rich Lesser, CEO and the president of BCG, Mr. Wang Jun.、Uh, Managing partner of BGI, and Mr. Zhu Ning, Deputy Dean of a Professor of Finance at the Shanghai Advanced Institute of Finance. Please remember to silence your cell phone or turn it off. It's a tele televised. Thank you for your cooperation, Mr. Wang. For SOEs, in order to innovate, actually. Uh, people think、uh, SOEs are just like elephants.、Uh, can elephants dance? Thank you. When we talk about new normal today, as uh, the uh, chair has already mentioned, new normal touches upon all aspects of our life. From the perspective of SOEs, or even larger scope. The IT sector I have been working with,、uh, a lot of changes will also happen. The biggest、uh, change, for example, in the past more than 10 years, cell phone can be an example. In the past more than 10 years, each year, the three、uh, network operators in China、uh, have、uh, additional. Increase of、uh, cell phones of、uh, about 100 million per year. Now it's a、uh, 1.3 billion、uh, cell phones in China each year. Their business volume increase, including phone calls and、uh, SMS. But now things have changed.、Uh, on average, each Chinese person owns a cell phone, so you cannot have so much growth each year. We now have new applications like WeChat,、uh, Weibo, and the voice uh, uh, business has dropped and. Text message has also dropped as a business. All these、uh, are the very normal challenges under the new normal. So, how to deal with this? 
to be brief, uh, I would like to focus on three points. Number one, I think information technology is still growing. About uh, 10 years ago in 2005, uh, Thomas uh, Friedman, uh, Friedman write uh, a book, uh, the word is flat. So uh, to flatten the world, there are uh, 10 driving forces. From 2005 to today, a decade has passed. Along the way, we also experienced a global financial crisis. But the only thing hasn't stopped is the science and technology progress. I can add another 10 factors to what Mr. Friedman mentioned in the, uh, in the book. For example, smartphone. 4G, LTD, uh, social network, uh, cloud computing, 3D printing, robot, uh, Internet of Things, uh, online uh, payment, uh, uh, Internet finance, uh, big data. So uh, we are not saying the market demand is uh, shrinking. Actually, there are fundamental changes with the market demand. This is something we have to notice under new normal. These uh, new internet uh, technology or information technology create uh, new changes and bring entrepreneurship uh, with more room. And secondly, we should enable a new uh, favorable ecology for uh, innovation and uh, entrepreneurship. Um, Michael Potter from MIT proposed a value chain concept, which mentions that the overall enterprise is composed with the different components. Only when you have a synergy in the value chain can you have your competitiveness. So that's about uh, creating value based uh, on the enterprises. Uh, it's a very classic uh, theory, and we have been applying that. But now, given the new normal, things are changing. Today, we should uh, stress one other concept, uh, ecological system, business uh, ecosystem. So it does not only focus on the competitiveness of uh, any certain enterprise. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it is an analogy of the ecosystem in nature. It focuses very much on the coordination and the synergy between different uh, living features. So today, when uh, we talk about innovation in the new normal, we should also focus more on the business uh, ecosystem. So coming back to my industry, because uh, I'm a layman for all the other industries, people are talking about the, vo the shrinking of a voice business and text message. Do we not uh, need any uh, network operators anymore? So on the other hand, I think data uh, business has increased uh, very much. A few years back, uh, most uh, Chinese uh, c uh, customers use about uh, five RMB package of uh, data service. But today, uh, after four years of uh, after f uh, two years of uh, 4G license, uh, the average monthly expenditure of uh, uh, per capita. Uh, is about uh, 700 megabytes of data business. So I do not think that OTT or uh, internet uh, service providers or uh, tel telcos are competitors uh, with each other. Instead, uh, they are complementary to each other. And secondly, telcos need to uh, transform themselves and to learn from the internet service providers. And they should also engage in such a business. However, I don't think that uh, telecom uh, should uh, convert themselves into service providers like uh, Google and uh, Baidu. Baidu because uh, they are two different parts of the value chain. They can cross the border a little bit. Uh, however, they're providing different functions and roles. And last point. Given the new normal, there, uh, we have a still a very long way to go for innovation. We have made a lot of progress already on innovation. 
take the example of a cell phone again. In the past two years, uh, cell phone manufacturer manufacturing has developed very well in China. A large batch of uh, Chinese brands of uh, cell phones uh, have emerged. So many competitors and players in this market. In the past, uh, we find only a few manufacturers of uh, cell phones in the world. In China, however, today, there are several hundred of them. This is not a bad thing. So many uh, players, uh, each one can survive in this market. And secondly, we have uh, shifted uh, from only assembly to having capabilities uh, at the upstream and both downstream. A lot of the components uh, and even the chips for cell phones are manufactured by Chinese vendors. This is a great progress because we have a lot of Chinese brands and dramatically slash the price of smartphones. It's hard to imagine in the past about $100 uh, can be the price for a 4G LTD phone. This is uh, the great progress made by innovation. Still a long way to go for innovation. Back to cell phones, so many cell phones are selling very well. However, most of the cell phones are using the same operating system, the same chips, the same uh, components. That's why they're quite uh, similar to each other. It's very hard to differentiate your cell phones from others. So we need to go deeper first and uh, conduct more research and development. We should even develop new operating system for cell phones. And secondly, we should also be more patient. It's not enough to have only a very good sales record. We need to accumulate our own technology experience, especially IP, our own IP, in order to achieve uh, made in China and uh, created in China. Thank you very much, Mr. Wang. In general, in summary, you mean as long as we can unleash innovation and creativity. The market demand is still there, right? Yes, on the market demand, I'm very op optimistic. I didn't mention about the demand of internet service. As we all know, the demand is very big. It's very interesting from the IT perspective, cell phone manufacturer uh, revenue is much more than the network or a network equipment itself, while internet service revenue is uh, much more than the manufacturing of cell phone. So in the future, we will see substantial market for all of the three areas. Um, the Chinese economic slowdown is seen already. However, the international investment and the analytic uh, uh, community are very pessimistic about the Chinese economy. They tell me that the next year China's uh, GDP growth will be about uh, zero percent or even negative growth. Do you agree with this uh, pessimistic view? N not at all. Um, <laughs> I, I think, um, first of all, there's a wide range of views in the, in the rest of the world. I was speaking to a, a leader of a large international company last week who has a lot of business in China who thinks the growth is quite optimistic around the growth. Goldman just came out with a report quite optimistic around the growth. I mean, optimistic in the six to seven range as opposed to around zero that you said. I, I, think, I think we're witnessing a very substantial and appropriate transition in the Chinese economy right now. We're witnessing an economy that over the last decade was built largely on the backs of investment and a lot of that investment going into infrastructure and real estate and the latter part of that requiring lots of debt that, and not necessarily being able to use that capital particularly productively. And what we're watching right now is a transition that's appropriate to one that is more consumption led and more service driven and less dependent on investment. But that has several implications that are playing through right now. One implication is that um, any time you make a transition in an economy of that nature, it's going to have uncertainty and volatility around it. And we're watching that happen in China right now, and that would be, that would be natural. It's also worth noting that 
in the shift towards more consumption as a part of the economy, inherently the government's ability to write a check to just solve it in a very centrally controlled way goes down. And that in, in a sense, the strong statement that's come out um, from the leadership starting at the third plenum that the market would be the decisive force in the economy is a recognition that there will have more volatility in China and more uncertainty. And we'll see some of that in the years ahead. And we're watching even now, I think, the government adapting to that new reality and growing a bit more comfortable with that with that uncertainty. How that exactly plays out, what policies are put in place, we, we don't know. I would like to stress a couple points. One is the stock market is important, but it's not as important in driving the underlying economy as I think some in the Western media think, meaning uh, the total market capitalization in China is about 40% of GDP. In contrast, the total market capitalization of the US stock market is 140% of GDP. So it's just a very different role. I'm not minimizing that it's important, but the degree to which it's important is often, often overstated. Most Chinese households don't earn shares, and even those that do don't own the majority of their financial assets in shares. And we've watched, even through July, so even after the June decline in the, in the market, we've watched actually underlying consumer demand uh, re remain relatively strong. Autos have slowed, but overall, uh, consumption has maintained a fairly good pace. The second point is we're witnessing two changes and it's important to recognize both of them. The, the first is the shift from investment to consumption that I said earlier. But the second is where is the consumption occurring? Because even a couple years ago, people tended to talk about the consumption in the context of the very big cities, uh, the tier one cities, in the traditional retail distribution environment and in the context of the growing emerging middle class in China. We're actually watching all of that change before our eyes. That in fact, most of the growth that's occurring will occur in the upper middle class. The people that are earning 150,000 RMB per year or higher, which will continue to grow double digit over the next five years, as President Wang just spoke to in an IT context. We're watching the, the lower tier cities, different people classify them this different ways, but still enormous growth potential in the lower tier cities. And then finally, we're watching massive growth in the online world. To put it in context, China consumption should grow about $320 billion uh, this year, which is still quite substantial, 8 to 10 percent growth in consumption. The internet, the online world, will be about half of that total consumption, half of the growth will come from the online world. So, so for all companies, Western uh, Chinese, learning to adapt to the new environment of where growth is coming and how it's evolving will be incredibly important. And then the last thing I wanted to speak to was the policies ahead. There's a lot of focus on China. I would go back to what um, was said a couple years ago, including what was said at this forum uh, by, by Premier Li, which is, the market as the decisive force in the economy is really important, and real reform is fundamental to get China on, on a good growth path for the years ahead. And that's been stated policy for several years, and we've seen good progress. We've seen some progress on the financial side. We've seen some progress in creating mis municipal bonds to create more transparency into, into local government debts. We, we now have some private banks that are authorized. But I would just go back to those two themes and say, I think the test for the coming years um, is to take those, Paul, take those principles and turn them into reality on the ground and to continue the progress that's been made and to recognize that with the market becoming the decisive force, it means creating more opportunities to support um, uh, SMEs to support small and medium enterprises to ensure that the capital that goes into SOEs is effectively used. Uh, with, with real reform is reform in terms of supporting urbanization, frankly in supporting SOE reform because many of the SOEs need to undertake reform to be more competitive, to have more effective governance models that enables them to undertake hard things like restructuring and to continue to make progress in that agenda. And so. From my standpoint, the looking ahead, from all the research we see, the underlying outlook 
should have positive growth in it. The growth in the consumption side should continue. It will have more volatility. And the key success factors are the ability to take what I think was a very um, good stated policy of several years ago and continue to make the, the very hard changes underneath it to turn it into reality. And as a final note, when we talk about how hard it is to make reform happen in China, we shouldn't forget how hard it is to make reform happen everywhere else in the world. We watch Europe right now really struggling. I mean, Europe's got a bigger growth challenge than China and is still struggling to make reform happen. We talk about um, uh, the third arrow in Japan and how hard it is to make that happen. We talk about real reform in the US and how difficult that's been, or in India. So the fact that reform is difficult here, yes it is, it's difficult everywhere to undertake these changes. But that doesn't make it any less important to continue the growth path, even if it's at a slightly lower rate than the one that China has been on. How about the economic consumption? You feel very positive, but we see, think that uh, there are some indicators, for example, housing, in the housing sector, for many years, uh, they are not developing rapidly for the automobile consumption. This is another area for the automobile consumption is not also very good this year. You've also mentioned the e-commerce and the, con the contribution for the consumption growth. But I believe that many retailers would tell you that this is uh, to replace actually the physical shop uh, uh, sales by way of online shopping. Well, the really new consumption or the new need is really needed, is really limited. So how do you think about this kind of negative factors for the growth of consumption? Thank you. So, so first, I think you're pointing out some, some near-term challenges. But I would note, at least what I've seen of the recent market data on real estate is that we're starting to see a bit of a rebound. It's true auto sales have been flatter, but actually, um, auto sales had up really well, even through the first quarter of this year, and we always see volatility in auto sales. Actually, um, I'm bullish, not at the extraordinary growth rate in autos that we saw in years past, but that that, that can continue to be a strong market. And then finally, I would say the retailers who point to the challenge of the growth of online are exactly right. China is unique in the way it is growing a highly innovative online world, almost in parallel with the growth of its offline service infrastructure. In most parts of the world, the service environment had developed over many decades. And when online came along, it was challenging a very established, very embedded, very well-developed offline retail infrastructure. In China, the growth has been so rapid that in fact the two are occurring in parallel and the online space is therefore even more powerful, even a higher share of the growth. And I think the challenge for both manufacturers and traditional retailers is going to be how they adapt their innovation model, their distribution model, and their customer relationships to deal with a world where consumers here are increasingly living their lives online uh, mobile is, is growing exponentially and making more and more of their decisions in that way. And that presents a very big challenge for traditional manufacturers and retailers. Thank you. Wang Jun. Mr. Wang, the new normal to many traditional sectors, this is a big challenge. But for you, this may not be the case because the new normal to you probably from different perspectives we can imagine is something very positive. So in the bioeconomics, in genomics, in innovation. What are some of the big opportunities? Can you tell us from your own personal experience, what are some of the biggest opportunities? From my personal experience, because I myself have been working for over 20 years in bioscience and also uh, gene research, and also I've been CEO of uh, my uh, research institute. In this process, I really like to think about the social economy and the bioscience uh, combined together in terms of the principles. Just now, from the moderator, I think you talked about some key terms. For example, in high growth, some of the enterprises experienced the high growth, but now they were experiencing a sharp uh, stop of the growth. 
for some enterprises. So in this process, and also you talk about the new normal, this term, what does it mean? New means that the past situation has been changed, and also it will not go back to the back situation for enterprises, individuals, and also for society, if the design of which cannot adapt themselves to the new normal, that is in the environment, if a space cannot adapt to the change of the situation of the environment, then it is doomed to uh, dies. So in this kind of new situation, in this evolution, if the design of the enterprises, of the institutions cannot adapt themselves to the new norm, to the new normal, they will experience many bottlenecks and difficulties or challenges. So in the natural world, if they encounter challenges like this, the best way is you know, uh, because they don't know what are uh, the uncertainties in the future, but they don't know what kind of change it's going to be. So in the natural world, as an individual species, or the natural world, that is, they are changing themselves. In this process of change, they like to see what are the some of the arrows, so they try and learn by mistakes. So in a society, this means innovation. Innovation, in essence, is a kind of uh, try and arrow experience. So the nature of this determines that actually if you try and make experiments, sometimes you fail. So if you want to do innovation, you want to select a big um, sector or a big direction. Why do I say so? Because the development of the society, including China, from the agricultural revolution to industrial revolution to information, industrial, information revolution, etc. Many uh, experiments and tries have been made. Many mistakes have been made. So if you make innovation in the past uh, uh, different rounds of revolutions, uh, the cost will be very high because many people have tried that. So the new thing is that you identify a sunrise industry, a sunrise sector. There are many ideas, or there have not been many ideas. So this poses a great opportunity for you to be successful when you are trying to make experiments. But what are some of these sectors? I'm in the sector of gene sector, so I think house and uh, also the healthy life is actually posing a very good opportunity myself. I have already quitted my job as a CEO for my previous institution. I want to start my own business and, uh, again. So I want to look at the big data internet and also the intelligence together with uh, life science, with health sector, health management, etc., to digitalize this kind of uh, life information. This, to me, in the future, might be a uh, area of uh, great opportunity. And also in this area, if I make experiments or try, sometimes I might be making failures, but it's worthwhile because it also poses opportunities for me to be successful to, so for a certain extent, in the uh, evolution of the natural world. You can see that a human beings is just like a monkey that is making arrows and trying to experiment, eventually erect it and be human beings, while other monkeys failed in that process of natural evolution. But, but personally, I hope that in my new career, in my new business, I can eventually be successful, like the successful monkey who converted himself into human beings. So personally, I hope I can be that. So whether private enterprises or SOEs, I believe if you can fully develop your own ideas of innovation, if you are not afraid of failures, if you correct yourself and learn in this path to get new ideas, to push ahead, even if you are individuals or if in enterprises or the whole society, the society, the individual, or the enterprise would be always full of opportunity. So the term new normal in the future will evolve in the next 10 to 20 years. There will always be new normals. Thank you. You think it's more broad and more deep. Then I ask you two words. You have mentioned two words. I want to ask you this question. Two words are two words. What are the words? 那什么样？那试错跟试错是不一样的。那比如说我去试错，你来买单。
对吧？利益是我的，亏的是你的，这样的一种试错，也就别人你你试错，别人买单，政府买单，这样一种试错，你觉得可以吗？不，这样的试错现在在中国大地上普遍发生着。嗯，就是因为有很多钱嘛，嗯，这些钱它会投到一些上面，这些上面显然这个试错出的是利，对吧？这个很多买单的是是别人嘛，这个这是这是很自然的一个情况，但他一定会有人成功，所以他事实上我们可能不应该从个体角度来考虑他的试错错了以后是谁买单，嗯，我觉得更应该从一个群体角度来考虑，就这一群啊、呃、这一群人在创新，最终 you need to think about、uh, you need to think about who is making mistakes. Uh, whether the enterprise is making mistakes or not, you need to think from a holistic perspective, from the society perspective, from the world perspective. So this kind of um, making mistakes in the process of change is inevitable. Mr. Juning, last time we met, we've been talking about the potential risks in the Chinese enterprises. At that time, people were talking about the local debt or the non-performing loans of the banks. and. Uh, this time we meet again, so we, during which time we have experienced the, the disaster of the equity market and also the bubbles in the market. So up to now, whether you have some solutions, I think each and every one of us are actually learning. Just now, Mr. Wang Jun talked about making mistakes and uh, uh, experiment. So who benefit and who is paying the cost, etc. So. I have uh, wrote a book, Guarantee the Bubble. This is the book, Rigid Bubbles in Chinese. The core concept is that there are a lot of uh, investment behaviors, but actually the uh, professional investors are, are actually gaining the benefit. But if there are mistakes, the government is paying the bill. In the past uh, two years, uh, in the real estate uh, investment, uh, when there's a macroeconomic uh, uh, regulation, what happens uh, actually uh, when the housing price drops, uh, then the house owners uh, will argue with uh, the developer and uh, express uh, their complaints, uh, and they get some benefits uh, from the developer. Therefore, for example, uh, free uh, uh, free uh, furnishment and uh, free internal decoration, etc. So it seems that. Uh, People believe the government will bear all the losses and the risks, and you can generate a profit if it goes good. So uh, there is a lot of overinvestment in many areas, and uh, there is a lot of uh, speculative activities in investment. So that explains why the local government debt and after uh, REITs, there is also a lot of bubbles with uh, the stock market. Why there is the stock market bubble? Because uh, People think that uh, it's uh, safe in the Chinese uh, stock market. The government will always bail, uh, bail you out. Uh, and uh, this is a bullish market, uh, guaranteed by the market, by the government. This is a major risk. In the past uh, 20 or 30 years, uh, this implicit guarantee in terms of institution or capital market or the products, such a uh, government implicit uh, guarantee used to play important role for economic growth in China, but now China is already medium income country, and in many act, uh, places of uh, the economic uh, situation, there is a very serious uh, excess capacity. Why there is a serious uh, local government debt, two main contributors. One is infrastructure and real estate. The other is uh, local SOEs and local investment uh, projects uh, supported by the government. Uh, typical examples are wind power and solar panel projects, which were extensively invested without considering the risks properly. So we should really uh, learn from those uh, uh, lessons and try to find a balance between the government intervention and the market, and uh, uh, so that the market can play a deterministic role in resource allocation. When we talk about asset price or local government debt, excess capacity or SOE reform, such challenges all boil you down how to give the government the appropriate role and so that market can play the important role. So, uh, Mr. Wang Jun. 
Sir Justin now Juning gave a comprehensive view, especially he mentioned about the entrepreneurship investment sector. There's a, a, the potential moral hazard. If the government sponsors the investments, uh, the entrepreneurs uh, do not take the risk, so I'll shift the risk burden to the government when they start the business. How do you respond? Personally, I think the entrepreneurs have a great idea and try to uh, implement the idea. Logically, this person should uh, bear the risks for themselves, uh, economic risks or moral risks. So uh, to some extent, uh, the government's decision should be changed on entrepreneurship. You want to encourage innovation, but you should not uh, offer guarantee to any, any innovation activities. This is uh, some risks uh, the individual people or the businesses should bear. So this is uh, the responsibility of the entrepreneur instead of the government. We can offer some uh, better mechanism so that uh, uh, we can align the incentives to the human nature. Otherwise, uh, people think that I can take whatever risk. So this is just a trial and error without any cost, without any pressure, then uh, they will take too risky activities. Uh, if you don't offer such a guarantee, they might succeed. But if you are offering such guarantee, they're doing some silly things. So in Sili, I think uh, in, in Shenzhen, uh, the Shenzhen municipality, the municipal government offers a lot of guidance and support, enabling policies for uh, innovation instead of uh, sponsoring innovation all the time. So um, we need the uh, capital market support in terms of a VC or PE or angel investment for entrepreneurship, for startups. So finally, the exit in the healthy stock market since the bubble burst in uh, Chinese stock market, China and the whole world. Do you think uh, there will be cool down in uh, the passion uh, in this from the stock market on uh, startups. I think there's uh, some new change. Yes, uh, the environment has changed a little bit. The stock market is volatile and the capital uh, becomes more uh, conservative. This is something good because uh, uh, in this case, uh, people will focus on those uh, worthy deals, uh, and it's more rational and more uh, successful if you are really uh, contributing value. And the price will come back to the value, and sometimes even undervalued, then there's a lot of uh, potential for you to do. Uh, so for different people, it means different uh, possibilities. So you mean uh, more choices for the entrepreneurs, less? Do you have any comments about this? Yeah, yes, actually. I, just to build exactly on that point, when you talk to people who lived in Silicon Valley after the bubble burst in 2000 and the NASDAQ went down 70% in a very short space of time, they would say the environment for innovation got better, not worse. Because then it was only, be, then the capital was smarter and it was funding really good entrepreneurs with good ideas, but it wasn't just funding anything, and there weren't 10 people chasing every idea. And so I think the idea that because the stock market is down, there'll be no more innovation is, is not correct. I think there's no reason, there's still, everybody can look at China and see the underlying potential, and I think that uh, we'll continue to see it, but hopefully we'll see smarter money going after better deals rather than any deal, and that's healthy. Yes, i like to follow up. <laughs> Apart from the life science uh, act, uh, field, uh, another hot field is the uh, internet, or internet plus, or internet finance, my profession. So there's the issue how to make evaluation about uh, innovation. So life science uh, means a lot of technology uh, breakthrough, but the internet uh, is more about uh, redistribution and reshaping the resources and industries. Uh, internet finance or P2P is now very hot, including crowd finance. 
not only it assembles the information uh, so that capital can easily find investment opportunities. In addition, Mr. Lesser mentioned about volatility. This is very important. Um, to some extent, uh, crowd finance or P2P has uh, covered uh, some risks uh, or shifted some risks. Uh, which should be borne by investor and the platforms. So it's not only social behavior uh, and uh, enterprise behavior. We need more regulation on the market so that we can serve the new technology and the business model innovation better. So you are guiding to, uh, leading to a new question. Just now, a few panelists all mentioned about the volatility in the market. So. Uh, or uncertainty, whether the government has strengthened their capabilities uh, in uh, response to such uh, volatility or uncertainty, how to increase such capabilities? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I think um, the, the, re the response, I mean, look, this is a new environment, and the government had indicated that it wanted to make real changes, that it wanted to drive reform, it wanted to strengthen the market, and we, and we see an underlying transition in the economy from investment to consumption, and those represent major transitions. And we should expect that there will be some time while the government is figuring out the right set of policy moves and the right actions to respond in that different, different environment and to spur the economy. And I fully agree with the comments that what you don't want to do is have risk so subsidized that people take unnecessary risks, they don't deploy capital smartly, and then they expect a guaranteed return. But moving to a different model takes some time to sort of work through it. I think the moves in the recent re weeks, both around the currency and around the market, and the willingness to tolerate more swings uh, is the right thing to do. And I, and, I, and I understand the logic of doing that in a more measured way, not flipping a switch and changing the whole system overnight. This is a very big economy to try to turn everything over at once. But I think that moving in that direction, allowing the markets to settle at their own place over time, you know, we talk, you talked about the crisis of the stock market, but it's up 50% from where it was a year ago. There are very few parts of the world you say the stock market grew 50% over the last year and we're in a complete crisis. It's, it's, it went up too far, it overshot, it's coming back down. No one knows if it's settled at the right place or it needs to come down further. But, but, but I think the more that the government creates a stable platform but actually tolerates more uncertainty and then encourages capital to flow to the best entrepreneurial ideas, to small and medium enterprises, to SOEs that are, un, that are willing to take hard reforms and restructure themselves, even at some near-term pain, in order to be more globally competitive in the future. The more it can encourage that, the more it creates the underpinning for growth in the future. But that's not an easy transition, and so I expect we'll see ups and downs. And, and ultimately, the government will have to make some choices about how far it's really ready to go down that path. Uh, Wang Zhong. Mr. Wang. Just now, we mentioned a lot about uh, how private business uh, can re react to the new normal. Uh, there are some challenges uh, for private businesses, but uh, they are in relatively c better conditions compared to SOEs. Uh, under the new normal, what mechanisms uh, should the SOE employ in response to that? So one is uh, uh, institutional change or uh, merger and acquisitions of uh, central SOEs, et cetera. So we hear a lot of rumors about uh, such mergers in the market. Uh, given the new normal, there are a lot of volatility, uh, especially in central SOEs. Uh, they are very huge in size and uh, very hard to turn around. How to adapt to the new normal? This is a good question. So me personally, I worked uh, for SOEs for several decades after I've retired from them. Uh, I'm also the chairman of uh, the Chinese uh, Public Listed Company Association. Uh, a lot of uh, central SOEs in this association also. People have uh, very high hopes of the SOE reform in China. However, uh, the media seems very disappointed. Whenever they talk about SOE reforms, as you mentioned, they talk about mergers and 
and acquisitions. And so, so-called SOE concept of stock means that there will be merger and acquisitions, and you should buy them. So uh, it seems that the only way of SOE reform is the merger of two SOEs. Actually, this is only a very small portion of SOE reform. Actually, firstly, by SOE reform, in the past several decades, we should recognize the great contribution to economic growth from Chinese SOEs. And secondly, we definitely need to reform SOEs. And the most attention is given to, uh, according to our association's survey, to more than uh, several dozens of public listed companies. The most attention is given to the ownership structure. Whether private business or SOEs are very interested in mixed ownership reform. Actually, we have already uh, gone the first step of uh, mixed ownership. A lot of uh, SOEs have uh, went public, uh, a lot of uh, introducing public investors and have uh, mixed ownership. But we need to go further. So uh, given the mixed ownership, we have uh, state-owned uh, capital, collective capital, and non-public capital, etc. So such a mixture. Uh, is uh, placed uh, with very high hopes uh, by many people. That, that's for one thing. But more hopes uh, are in order to uh, uh, change the current mechanism of SOE, we can change the mixed ownership. For example, we stress the deterministic role played by the market forces on resource allocation. <laughs> to do market forces. And if we can do that, when we have diversified equity shares, but all the mechanisms are the same. So in our case, then this failed to serve the purpose of reform. So in our research, we also find that uh, for the uh, enterprises who have highly market-driven forces, some are not, but eventually their business results are quite different. And also, when we talk about today's SOEs, they are fully capable of, through market, to get resources, rather than using administrative allocation of resources. And also, for private enterprises, they are also interested in this. They are interested in this uh, equity or M&A. They need to have a voice rather than making a financial uh, investment in this. So from the SOE perspectives, people are really interested in the above-mentioned points. Mr. Zhu, so in our discussion, we've been talking about uh, letting the market to play decisive roles. We know about the reason behind that, and this has been stated many times. We also know that when there are more business opportunities, when they are daunting economic situations, and then we need to let the market to play more decisive roles. But there's a tendency of not letting the market to play decisive role in difficult situations. So what is your perspective? So in economic perspective, we talk about the reverse choice. This when we talk about the missed type of ownerships, this is a very uh, outstanding issue. From the private capital, they hope that they can get involved in SOE, not only as an institutional investor, but rather to be involved in management of the enterprise. So this is something like whether SOE is, is somebody everyone wants, that is, everyone wants to make investment in SOE, or people do not want to make investment in SOEs. So when you are making financial investment, probably uh, SOEs are not so interested in this capital side. So this is the dilemma that the investors are actively making invest investment in SOEs, but actually SOEs are not lacking of capital. 
So if a private capital or private enterprises, if they make the capital, if they cannot uh, get the control of the enterprise in terms of the enterprise management or using my own uh, management concept to management the invested company, so that's a problem. So this, that's why we talk about the reverse choice. And this is also something that's faced by the reform and also by the reform enterprises. So from the country's pers from the government's pers perspective or from the uh, market perspective, we need to think about this. That is, uh, the short-term steam and long-term quality and sustainability should be balanced. In the past, people are talking about 8% 9% or 11% growth rate. We talk about this kind of uh, growth rate, but after this round of big adjustment, still we're doing very well on a global scale. The performance is good. So we look at this. We need to have a rational expectation of our growth rate. Growth rate. Only when we have a rational expectation, when we experience volatility, we can have the wisdom and patience to allow time for this kind of adjustment. As has been said by Mr. Wang, people made research about the bankruptcy enterprises in the United States. And also, if the enterprise go bankrupt, it's OK. We should allow those kind of bad enterprises to be phased out so as to speed up the reform. And secondly, this is also something, has something to do with the relationship of China and the rest of the world. For example, the RMB uh, exchange rate adjustment also has repercussions around the world. Actually, this is something here in China for China's economy, for the policy formulation, we also need to think about our decision, our adjustment, and its uh, impact on the global world, and also the global responses in return might also have some uh, implications on China's export, on China's investment. So as China is in converging more with the rest of the world, we need to make more scientific uh, decisions. Yeah, I agree with what we have said, actually. Uh, getting public or to do M&A, etc. For SOEs, SOEs welcome this kind of mixed uh, ownership. It's not only because that they want capital, but rather through this kind of uh, mixed uh, ownership, they want to learn and attract the advantages from other types of ownerships so that they complement each other. So when the enterprises get listed, uh, people often think about uh, getting listed of the Chinese enterprises is to get money. But this is not only to get money and capital, but rather to change their institutions and the governance. So I think this really means that SOEs want to get this opportunity to uh, improve themselves in this process. On President Wang's point, um, I was talking to the CEO of a Chinese large SOE earlier in the year, and they had grown by acquiring other companies around China. But as a result, many provinces owned parts of the company. And those provinces were quite concerned about any changes that would be disruptive to being to lose jobs, to lose you know, local headquarters and other things. So the result of the governance model made it very cumbersome to do what the leadership of the company knew they should do, which is streamline the headquarters, make it more efficient, make it more productive. And so part of it may be attracting outside capital and mixed ownership, but part of it is just cleaning up the governance so that company leadership can take the kinds of important but sometimes challenging calls to become more efficient and productive and innovative to be able to drive growth in the future. And it's a very important element of the broader SOE reform agenda. We have some time left for the audience. You can raise your hand and also uh, introduce yourself and also target your question to our speakers. Microphone, microphone, please. Um, my name is Wang Jianzhong from 
Bohai, I and Steel Group, we're talking about innovation and reform. I want to talk about this. Actually, the state uh, council had an opinion document to deepen SOE reforms, whether you're using Shanghai model, Beijing model, or Tennessee model. Mr. Wang Jianzhou, you've been working for SOEs for many years. I want to ask you, and as well as the rest of the panelists, to talk about SOE reforms. What's your suggestions from your own perspectives? I think the SOE model has many. Most importantly, we need to know why we want to let SOE to conduct reform. I think if we talk about the ultimate aim of SOE REAM, we want to have uh, uh, the value to keep the value of SOE and also to increase efficiency and productivity, etc. But from the direct aim of SOE reform, this is really to better realize the resource allocation, that is, letting the market to play a decisive role in the allocation of the resources. So I think there are different ways of SOE reform. Now, based on the current SOE reform models, we can also innovate, for example, we have uh, the group company, and also they have a lot of listed companies, and also the group company uh, getting listed holistically. Therefore, in terms of the management, this will increase efficiency. And also, at the group company level, they can also have uh, the investment uh, operating company to regulate the management. Right now, the listed company, they have a parent company, they have a listed company, the parent company, and also the listed company in terms of the management. It's sometimes uh, uh, not very clear, because if there is a meeting, they don't know whether it's the meeting for the listed company or the f parent company or for both. So this is kind of chaos. So this kind of things needs to be further, further clarified and improved. I want to add one thing, that is, we need to believe that in the long term, the market can eventually have a rational allocation of resources, but this allocation should have a mobility. Some of the equity should be traded in the marketplace. Next question. Second row. I'm from Tencent Finance. I'm a reporter. I want to ask Mr. Wang Jianzhou, SOE, there are two realistic things to be addressed. The chairman and also the senior management teams, who will appoint them? And also for these team, how can you give them incentives? How can you make improvement? That's a very good question. I also want to follow up. That is, for SOEs, they want to uh, further stimulate its vitality of the SOEs. But then, you know, for SOEs, they have uh, senior management, senior management teams. How can we govern them? So this question, you ask me, I'm retired. I only get my retirement fees. So you don't have to challenge me with that. Well, actually, starting from last year, the summer Davos talking about uh, SOE management team uh, senior management teams, uh, salaries, etc. To be frank, for big SOEs, their management teams, senior management teams, actually, the key person, they are not paying a lot of attention for their salaries because they have many things on their head, thinking about the management of the enterprises, while for the personal interest, they might not be that kind of interest. If it's high, they work. If this salary is, not, is low, they still work very hard. So for private enterprises, and also sometimes the CEOs, they only get one yuan, or one dollar as a salary, as a symbol. So when people talk about SOE reform, we talk about uh, uh, M&A. When we talk about SOE reform, we want to ask whether the CEO or the chairman is getting a very high salary. So this is only one part. This is not the whole picture of SOE reform as to how can we realize the reform of the remuneration system for SOEs. Right now, we do not see a very concrete plan at the moment. but. On the whole, I think we need to narrow down the gap. 
of the salaries between the senior management team with that of the ordinary staff. This indeed is a direction. I remember I interviewed an SOE bank. They talk about their internet finance, the strategies, etc. I asked him one question. What is their incentives? Whether their incentives are different from the marketplace? They think that actually it's similar for this CEO. He thinks this is his career. This is something to motivate him to work on a daily business. So I think this might raise some doubt in the marketplace because people are not very familiar. We have time for only last question. I'm from GE, General Motors, actually. I have listened to your discussions. I was thinking about the SOEs, whether SOE, uh, you can use SOE asset and capital to make mistakes that is trial and error, like has been said. Because SOEs, they have a lot of uh, social responsibilities. And uh, this is something that is, uh, a must for the SOEs to undertake social responsibilities by the government. But if they make mistakes, so this is actually different from really operating on the marketplaces. I would like to take up this question. This question actually is something I would really much want to address. Quite often, we hear that people say that SOE made a lot of uh, progress and made a large contribution in terms of the tax, etc. If I am an SOE, I can create a lot of profit and make big success. But the SOE leaders are also thinking when they think about the internet companies, they think about the companies headed by Mr. Wang Jun, they have a lot of innovations. They think, oh, if I have your mechanisms and governance model, we can also do that. So for me, my experience is that as an enterprise, I want to create value. If I'm an SOE, I want to create value for the state-owned capital. If I'm a listed company, I want to create value for my shareholders. Also, in doing so, we want to take social responsibilities for the society and also for our own employees. So for SOEs, we want to try very, much, very hard to work for, uh, to create value for the investors, for the consumers, and also to create values for our staff. Uh, China's had remarkable success in the decades to date on a model that leveraged its enormous labor force, a low-cost labor force, a very, very hardworking culture, and a willingness to invest over and over again. And as a result, has achieved a remarkable transformation in a few decades. But looking at the decade ahead, the key element will be not the competition based on cost, but the ability to drive total factor productivity, the productivity of labor and capital, and the ability to drive innovation in a very deep way in the economy. And the SOEs play such an important role in the overall economy of China that anything that can be done in reform in terms of how capital is deployed, in terms of how governance models work, that will encourage them and incent them to make these hard moves to driving overall productivity of capital and labor and will encourage them to be more innovative. Maybe not as innovative as we heard here, but, but to be able to continue to push that forward. As many have done, but there's still a ways to go, I think will be a, an important element of the future growth in China in the years ahead. Uh, let me just add two comments. Number one, a trial and error will be costly. So, uh, of course, uh, in order to change something, not all of the central SOEs uh, have to change overnight, but we can have a pilot project uh, at a smaller scale in the beginning, just like the evolution of natural species. Uh, they actually started with very small scale. And uh, secondly, 
to some extent, uh, either the enterprises uh, or the government need a trial and error for reform. So government reform also need to try. So we cannot assume that the government uh, will never change. Actually, government will change based on trial and error. So just uh, one sentence. Uh, Mr. Coase, Nobel laureate, mentions that uh, the nature of uh, corporate businesses is to reduce transaction cost. So uh, for reform of SOE or economy, it's aimed to reduce transaction cost in the market. Excellent presentations and discussions. Uh, let us uh, thank the panelists for the great uh, discussions. Thank you very much.